This is a common story. Countless guys have been caught off guard by the unexpected turns of life, and I was no exception. Everything seemed perfect until everything fell apart. My name is Blake Ramsey, and at 31, life was pretty good. I had a full-time job at Space Conquest, part of a large aerospace company, where we worked on an exciting NASA project. I was responsible for developing a rescue system for a new manned spacecraft, a dream job for a space engineer. My wife Tracy and I had been happily married for seven years, and we had three children, Tyler, seven, and twin girls, Beth and Emily, six. Family was everything to me, and I always tried to combine work with a good rest. We were lucky to have our parents around, who loved pampering their grandchildren, and Tracy's sister, Lucy, was also a big part of our lives. We lived in a cozy neighborhood in a spacious four-bedroom house and planned to convert the basement into additional living space when our daughters grow up. Tracy and I first met in college, where we quickly fell in love and got married. While I was doing aerospace engineering, Tracy worked as a paralegal. She took a break from work after the birth of our son Tyler, but returned after the twins arrived. When our daughters started going to school, Tracy's behavior began to change, pointing out hidden problems in our relationship that I hadn't noticed before. Before the situation took a turn for the worse, I met Tracy's boss, Stanley Cross, several times at social events and the company's Christmas party. I didn't feel much sympathy for him, considering him arrogant and rude, and I didn't trust him. Whenever I visited Tracy at work, I noticed that Cross was showing possessive feelings and hesitated to let her go. I was closely watching for any signs of a romantic relationship between them, but at that moment, I didn't notice anything. The turning point came after the twins graduated from kindergarten. After leaving them at my parents for the weekend, I was looking forward to spending time alone with Tracy to focus on our relationship. When I arrived home, she was dressed to the highest standard, in a stunning short black dress, high heels, and flawless makeup. Wow, you look incredible, baby, I exclaimed. If you had said we were going somewhere, I would have hurried home. I quickly refreshed myself and changed my clothes, ready to go where she had planned. But Tracy's grin hinted at something else. Actually, we're not going anywhere together, she said insidiously. I'll go out, but not with you. I was stunned. Wait, what do you mean? Tracy said that she had a date with her boss, Stanley Cross, and this is just the beginning. From now on, the new rules come into force. Stan will pick me up for the night, and I won't be home today or tomorrow since we're renting a room downtown. I'll be back Sunday afternoon, Tracy said. What do you mean? I exclaimed. You need to calm down and accept this new agreement, she replied. Everything will be as it will be. I'm leaving, but I'll be back on Sunday afternoon. It can't be, I protested. If you're leaving, then don't come back. I'll be back, Blake. We're still married and I'm coming home. But you have to understand I need more. If you complicate things, you'll leave on your own. Our children would be sad to see their father suffer financial ruin and go to jail. Let's sit down and discuss the necessary changes. It's best to settle this situation before Stan arrives, who will arrive in about 30 minutes. Believe me, you wouldn't want him to have to interfere, she said. If this jerk shows up in half an hour, he'll leave with a broken nose, I replied. Don't do this, Blake, Tracy said firmly, explaining it for two reasons. First of all, you should listen to what he's capable of if you don't obey. And secondly, Max, his bodyguard, will be with him. It's better not to mess with Max touching Stan can lead to a hospital visit, Tracy said. I felt a feeling I hadn't felt since I was in the army in the Middle East. At first I couldn't identify what it was, but then it dawned on me. I was ambushed. On one side was my wife, on the other was Stanley Cross, who was about to arrive, and I found myself in a difficult position. Careful planning and the element of surprise gave them an advantage and I didn't know how to defend myself. I pushed past Tracy and headed upstairs. Where are you going? asked Tracy. We really need to talk, she added. I just need to freshen up quickly. I'll be down in five minutes, I replied. During my service in the Middle East, I have been in three ambushes and developed several strategies for behavior in them. 
My first rule was to try to detect the ambush before it appeared, but in the case of Tracy and Stanley, I was caught off guard. The second rule was to find shelter quickly, so I immediately went to my bedroom. As for the third rule, I knew that I needed an escape plan for myself and my team, so I quickly designed it while I was walking to my room. After changing out of the suit into more casual clothes, I set up my iPhone to record and put it in my pocket. Then I went to my closet and rummaged through an old shoe locker. From above, I found the key to my drawer glued to the back wall. When I opened it, I saw my old uniform, which, surprisingly, still fit me ten years later. Under the form, I found folders with documents and a box with medals received during two business trips to the Middle East. After skimming through the medals, I focused on what I was really looking for, my 9mm Marine Corps Beretta pistol, which I affectionately called Betsy. It was stored in a plastic pouch with a fabric lining and two clips of cartridges. Although technically I shouldn't have kept my gun, the confusion surrounding leaving the service allowed me to keep it. This weapon had great sentimental value because it saved my life countless times in battle. As I was loading the clip, I heard Tracy calling me from downstairs. You'll regret this when I come down, I thought. I strapped the instrument to my belt behind my back and hid it under my shirt. To fire a double-action semi-automatic pistol, it was enough to cock the trigger. He was completely invisible, and if someone didn't actively look for him, they wouldn't notice. Before leaving the room, I took out my phone, turned on the recording and put it back in my pocket so that the camera was barely visible. I was determined to reveal the intentions of Tracy and her boss towards me. I decided to apply some of the interrogation techniques I learned in the Marines when I approached Tracy in the living room. She was sitting at the table with a glass of wine and beer, which prompted me to get straight to the point. Tracy, we need to talk before Stan gets here, I said. I saw that she had something on her mind, so I invited her to share her vision of the situation. Tracy, tell me about the new reality that I have to accept. She started by expressing her love for me and our family, but I interrupted her, insisting that she leave the sweet talk. I made it clear that I was neither sweet nor beloved to her, just Blake, and she was Tracy. Despite her annoyance, Tracy continued, saying that she and Stan had been having an affair for almost seven months. Their relationship went from innocent flirting to intimate encounters, which began when he promoted her to executive secretary. She admitted that Stan's courtship was flattering and that she was attracted to his power and attention. Tracy made it clear that this new reality must be accepted, otherwise there will be consequences. He was handsome, charming, and in great shape. It was hard to resist his attractiveness. We ended up on his couch, and he turned out to be a skilled lover. I liked it so much that I didn't want it to end, Tracy says. You didn't even think about the consequences and how much it would hurt me, I said. I'm sorry, Blake, but no, I wasn't thinking, she replied. But that doesn't mean I don't love you. You are the person I want to be with forever. I took a sip of beer and replied, Good luck making it happen. Tell me, Tracy, why now, after seven months of secrecy? She explained that they were tired of hiding their relationship and wanted to talk openly about it, including spending nights together and traveling as a couple. But they needed my agreement with their lifestyle. I took another sip of beer and thought about her words. Good luck to you, I said. Tracy bent down and tried to take my hands. No, Blake, we are not going to get divorced. We'll stay married. You just have to understand that Stan and I will be spending a lot of time together. I'll stay with him overnight a couple of times a week. We'll go on weekends, and maybe I'll even go on a longer vacation with him to Europe or the Caribbean. As his personal assistant, I will travel with him, meet important people, attend business meetings and social events. Stan pays me well. It's going to be good for us, Tracy said. I couldn't help but think about the advantages of the current situation. Vacations, college funds for our children, and finally the renovated lake house we've always dreamed of. But then I hesitated. Do I really want Stanley's company to finance all this? Tracy quickly objected, stating that she was an integral part of Stan's law firm. 
She considers it an honor to be his mistress, and this position, in her opinion, is quite appropriate in a relationship with such an influential person like him. Trying to convince me that this affair would not last forever, and that eventually we would return to a normal family life, she told me that Stan wanted to participate in our family's life and even offered to become an uncle for our children. Anger boiled inside me, but outwardly I kept my composure, refusing to let this man near my family. I asked why Stan, having his own marriage and the desire to have children, wants to interfere in our lives. Tracy explained that Stan's marriage was more of a marriage of convenience and that his wife couldn't have children. He wanted to have his own inheritance, ideally a son and daughter. I offered surrogacy, but Tracy told me that Stan wants any of his children to grow up in a loving family, and therefore he is interested in taking care of our children. When Tracy looked down, I felt a wave of panic wash over me. God, it started, I muttered, feeling my anxiety grow as Tracy's words sank in. Suddenly it dawned on me. He wants you to get pregnant, doesn't he? And then he expects me to raise his child, I realized out loud. Tracy quickly reassured me, saying, It's not just going to be his baby, it's going to be our baby, and you will love him because you love me. In addition, the child will have a surname, Cross. She continued, Stan will give us a lot of money to support the child and cover all expenses until he graduates from college. Thoughts flashed through my mind, and I stuttered, Wait, are you pregnant already? No, she replied but he's been asking me to stop taking the pills for months. I told him that I wanted you to agree to our new arrangement first. It can't get any worse, I muttered to myself. I emphasized my position once again. Good luck to you, I said. Tracy was clearly angry. Stop saying that, she snapped. I know you don't agree right now, Blake, but maybe you'll come to your senses. Her words struck a chord. When I got up to address her, the doorbell rang. Tracy hurried to answer, letting her boss in. When he entered the room, he put his arm around her waist and kissed her on the lips. The situation is only getting worse, I muttered to myself. How did he react? Cross asked Tracy. Not very well. You may have to talk about the consequences if he refuses to comply, she replied. I heard him say, then we'll move on to plan B. Shock and awe. Stan was a big man and taller than me. I couldn't figure out what Tracy saw in him. Perhaps his long graying hair gave him a certain outstanding appearance. Confident in himself, in a black suit, he approached me with an imperious air, invading my personal space. Mr. Ramsey, we need to talk, he said. To talk? I will kill you, I replied. He replied calmly, you can try, but my driver will most likely intervene before you can get far away and by evening you'll be in jail, so sit down. When I looked out the door, I saw a big guy waiting at the threshold. Reluctantly, I sat down. Great, now we can talk like adults, he said. When your wife became my personal assistant, it entailed additional responsibilities, including the closeness between us, he continued. We've been together for six months now, and we're tired of walking the streets. You and Tracy will have a new agreement. As my assistant, she will take care of my needs, both professional and personal. You will still be her husband, but I will take care of her needs as well. He went on to say that most of their meetings would take place at the hotel or in his office, but sometimes they would take place in my bed when I wasn't around. Outraged, I declared that I would rather divorce her for treason, but he warned me of the consequences, threatening to destroy me in court and beyond. He painted a grim picture of losing everything, including custody of my children. Shocked and speechless, I sat in disbelief while he talked in detail about what he and Tracy were willing to do for their affair. In conclusion, he made it clear that any attempts to interfere would lead to serious consequences, ensuring that I would obey their new agreement. He leaned over to me and whispered, Your wife is a great helper, and she also uses her mouth very skillfully. I turned to Tracy, feeling shocked. Are you really going to agree to all this? I asked. I hope not, Blake, she replied calmly. But as long as you cooperate, I won't have to. Eventually it will become the norm for you. 
still digesting what had just happened. I watched them head for the door. But before they could leave, I wanted to tell them something else. Wait, I have to tell you something important, I said. Stanley rolled his eyes, clearly annoyed. Tell me what's going on, but quickly, Stanley replied. After a few drinks and mourning my marriage, taking a deep breath, I plan to call your wife and tell her everything. I turned to Tracy. Then I'll tell your sister Lucy to break the news to your parents. Stan, confused by the answer, asked what was going on. Without repeating myself, I informed him that on Saturday morning I would change all the locks with the help of a locksmith. Now Tracy was completely focused and trying to figure out the situation. As soon as the locks are replaced, I plan to go to Kate's house, located nearby. Since her husband passed away a few months ago, she has been flirting shamelessly with me. She may be older than you and not a supermodel, but she has a great body. She even starred in a bikini for me once, I continued. An hour ago, I could not have imagined that I would be with someone else. But circumstances change, don't they? Tracy looked exhausted and spoke with difficulty. Blake, you can't do this, she said. I continued by informing them that when they returned on Sunday, all of Tracy's belongings would be waiting for them in the front yard. Every single thing from clothes and shoes to cosmetics and jewelry, even our wedding album, will be there. And no, they won't be neatly packed in trash bags, and they will have to hurry up and collect them before the watering machines turn on at four o'clock on Monday morning. Stan's anger was palpable. His face turned red and his fists clenched. It was clear that his threats had no weight. Tracy looked visibly upset when I delivered the final blow. I'm meeting with a divorce lawyer on Monday. I informed them that I would file for divorce on the grounds of infidelity, calling Stanley an accomplice. I will also sue him for interfering in our marriage and his firm for violating company rules. Even if the lawsuits prove unsuccessful, they will tarnish his reputation. Stanley's reaction was explosive. He threw his bag against the wall and moved towards me, invading my personal space. He warned me about his power and influence as a well-known figure in the legal community, threatening to arrest me by the time they checked into their hotel. Despite his bullying tactics, I was confident, not giving in to the urge to respond. I knew not to underestimate his ability to manipulate the law to his advantage. Stanley bragged about his connections in law enforcement and the district attorney's office, making it clear that he would stop at nothing to destroy me. Most of the judges in this city either owe me significant services or know that I have incriminating information on them. Even politicians are indebted to me because I helped them in every possible way in their election campaigns, Stanley said. He was clearly on edge, and I decided not to interfere. If you decide to go on a date with your friend Kate tomorrow, be prepared for the police to stop you and search your car for a trivial reason. It is likely that they will discover the pills, which will lead to a tip to the vice department, which will investigate the presence of offensive materials on your computer. This is just the beginning of possible legal battles and financial difficulties that you may face, he said. No lawyer would dare to challenge me. You will be left in ruins. Meanwhile, I'll be with your wife. Do you understand, you fool? Stanley turned his attention back to me. You have to show me respect. Address me as Sir or Mr. Cross. Call me by my first name again and Max will teach you a lesson in good manners. With that, he hit me twice with his right hand. But the second time, I quickly grabbed his hand with my left and bent all the fingers until they touched his wrist, holding them in place. Cross was stunned and seemed to be looking at his hand in shock. Soon, pain shot through him and he screamed in agony, falling onto the sofa. Tracy rushed to his aid as he clutched his injured arm to his chest, rocking back and forth in pain. You vile scoundrel! You will pay for this! I will make you suffer! He shouted. Remembering his bodyguard waiting outside, he called out to Max. Max, come here! The front door swung open and Max came into the room, big and imposing, looking like a tough guy from an old movie from the 40s. Yes, Mr. Cross, he greeted. Cross gestured at me with his uninjured hand and ordered, Take care of him, Max. Yes, Mr. Cross, Max replied, walking across the living room to me. 
Tracy tried to object, but Cross pushed her away. I foresaw a similar confrontation when Tracy said that Cross would bring his bodyguard. I knew that I might have to endure rough treatment. The situation was going to be difficult, especially considering that few people knew about my stay as a prisoner of war. It lasted only 17 days, but it was enough for me to receive a prisoner of war medal. During my captivity, I was the only American they captured, and they took out their anger on me, but I realized that I could withstand the difficulties. The real torture was that they hung me from a beam in the cell, and my hands were painfully tied behind my back. The torment was unbearable and endless. Therefore, compared to them, the beating was relatively easy. I stood my ground, offering no resistance, when Max swung his massive arm at me. The blow landed on my nose and I collapsed onto the coffee table, feeling disoriented. Max hesitated, not knowing if he should continue. He looked at Cross to get his opinion. Hit him, Max. Hurt him, Cross ordered. Max grabbed me by the hair, lifted me up and hit me again, this time in my left eye. I fell down again, my vision blurred. Realizing that I was on the verge of a breakdown, I sarcastically remarked to Max, You hit like a girl. Enraged by my comment, Max grabbed my hair again, preparing to strike. But he was caught off guard when I shot him in the leg, shocking everyone in the room. Max screamed in pain and staggered back, eventually landing in my favorite leather chair. I collapsed to the floor as he reached for another weapon. But I warned him, Don't do this, Max. Ignoring my words, he continued to reach for the weapon, and I fired again. Max dropped his weapon and screamed in agony. I crawled up to him, disarmed him, and asked, How many lives have you taken, Max? Max pressed the gun to his temple and shook his head, making it clear that he had never killed anyone. I told him about my own experience of destroying 27 people who were fighting for their beliefs, and asked Max, How much do you think I respect you? Max shook his head again in defeat. I have confirmed. That's right, Max, not at all. I said, I have no particular reason to keep you alive, do I? Max pleaded, I have a family. Well, I have a family too, and you don't seem to care much about mine. Maybe your family would be better off if you disappeared. Max began to beg, please. Glancing at Max's shoulder, I noticed, I shot you right in the shoulder joint, Max. You're going to bleed out if I don't get you to a doctor within an hour or so. But don't worry. Orthopedic surgeons can fix anything with all their plastic and ceramic bone substitutes they use. You may need to learn how to use your left hand for some things, such as eating, writing, or shooting. But most likely, you will have problems with the mobility of this arm for the rest of your life. And if you ever feel pain in that arm again, think of me. And if I see you again, I'll assume that you want to hurt me, and I won't hesitate to kill you. Do you understand? Max nodded in understanding, wincing in pain as I examined his wound. Oh, Max, I exclaimed in disappointment. The bullet went through his shoulder and my cherished chair, leaving blood on it. I wasn't sure if I could clean up this mess or repair the damage. The thought of having to replace the chair made me even angrier. It was stupid to mess with Max for so long, and leaving such an enemy behind was an even bigger mistake. Tracy's warning brought me back to reality just in time to see Cross swinging a fireplace poker at my head. Fortunately, my arm took the blow, but in the end it broke my forearm. Having no weapon, Cross made a move to grab my gun, but I quickly delivered a powerful blow to his groin, causing him to collapse in pain. I pulled out my 9mm pistol and held it down, demanding to open my mouth. Despite my order, Cross refused, pursing his lips and shaking his head in defiance. In response, I hit him hard, leaving a deep wound on his lip. I opened my mouth and forced the gun down his throat, making it difficult to breathe. I asked mockingly, How do you like my version of shock and awe? Do you remember what I told Max? You probably know that I killed 27 people in battle. Before you start resisting, Understand that this weapon requires only four ounces of pressure on the trigger, and I already have two ounces, I warned. So, where is your mobile phone? I demanded when Cross stopped resisting. 
Cross pointed to his left breast pocket and I took out his phone. Turn it on, I ordered. After making a thumbprint, Cross turned on the phone. Now FaceTime your wife, I ordered. Cross's eyes widened as he complied, and after a few calls, a woman answered. Stanley, why are you calling me at this hour? And who is this? The woman asked, alarmed by the appearance of an unfamiliar beaten man. Mrs. Cross, I began. My name is Blake Ramsey. You may not know me, but most likely you know my wife Tracy Ramsey, who works as your husband's personal assistant. I know Tracy, Mrs. Cross confirmed. What's going on? Why are you injured and where is my husband? I informed Mrs. Cross that I had her husband at gunpoint and tilted the phone to show her Cross's face. Oh my God, she exclaimed, please don't hurt him. Look, Mrs. Cross, we don't have much time. Your husband and my wife have been having an affair for several months now. They were planning to spend the weekend at the hotel today. When I objected, your husband ordered his assistant to beat me up. Unfortunately, I had to take action. And now your husband is next, I informed her. My husband should be at our residence in Palm Springs and working on this case, Mrs. Cross added. He's here in my house, Mrs. Cross, I said. And get to know my wife Tracy, I continued, pointing at Tracy, who was staring at the couch in fright. As you can see, my wife is already dressed and ready for a date with your husband, I remarked. It's unbelievable, Mrs. Cross replied. I was shocked too, I added. I have to go, Mrs. Cross. The police are coming soon. It was nice chatting, I said, ending the conversation. Turning to Cross, I said, I'm coming back to you, asshole. Now your wife understands everything. What was your plan? Should I send Max and his friends to make fun of me? I asked, glancing at Max. Max needs to get some rest, I commented, giving him a warning look. Send everyone you want and I'll take care of them before they help you, okay? Cross nodded in understanding. Suddenly, an unpleasant smell filled the room. Did you shit yourself? I teased, giggling. Now I need a new carpet. Hand me the briefcase, Tracy, I said, and she handed it over. I took out my laptop and pointed to the hard drive. Is all your important data here? I asked. Cross screamed, covering his ear. Apparently, his eardrum had burst. Then I moved away from Cross and told him to sit on the couch, and he obeyed, despite the fact that he was still clutching his groin and ear. I told Tracy to get a wet towel from the kitchen to help Matt with his bleeding shoulder. She hurried after him and quickly returned to help Max. After making sure that everyone was seated, I asked them to stay put, and I went to the kitchen to clean up, while the phone continued to record, realizing how important it was to hide the recording so that the police wouldn't delete it because of Cross's connections, I quickly hid the phone in a stack of dish towels in a drawer. After wiping my face with a damp towel, I returned to the living room. Cross was in pain, Tracy was helping Max, and I told them to wait for the cops, who would be coming with an ambulance soon. My neighbors heard a noise in the street and two of them have already dialed the 9-1 service. Among my neighbors was retired Marine Colonel Orson Sage, a close friend with whom I often drank beer. He affectionately called me Captain, and I called him Colonel. Are you okay, Captain? he asked. I've had better days, I replied. When sirens wailed in the distance, signaling the imminent arrival of the police, I turned to the Colonel for help. Colonel, could you lend me a helping hand? He readily agreed and went out onto the porch. Could you help me unload these pistols and put them on the table? I wouldn't want to hold one of them in my hands when the police arrive, I explained. The colonel quickly took out the cartridge from the weapon and put everything on the table on the porch. Kate, a widowed neighbor from the next street, saw my wounds and came to help. Turning to the colonel and Kate, I expressed a desire to explain everything, but noted that time was limited. I explained that my wife's boyfriend had threatened to give me pills. I gave the colonel the keys and asked him to hide my car if the garage was not cordoned off. I told him that the Gerjkot is the address of our street. Understood, Captain, he replied. Kate noticed. Blake, you look really bad, I confessed. My head is splitting and spinning. It looks like I was hit harder than I thought. With Kate's help, I sit down on the aperture steps, 
just as two police cars with flashing lights and sirens pulled up. They approached cautiously, holding weapons in their hands, but the colonel assured them that there was no threat, pointing to the unloaded pistols on that porch. I informed them about the three people inside. The policeman noticed my condition and said, It looks like you need medical attention. Soon, two ambulances arrived with flashing lights and sirens and emergency specialists hurried to the porch. Another officer informed them about the wounded man inside. When my dizziness got worse, Kate asked me to lie down while the paramedic examined my face, and I mentioned a possible fracture of my forearm. In a daze, I saw Max being carried out on a stretcher and Cross being helped into an ambulance. Tracy was accompanied by a female officer as they passed me. Tracy sobbed and apologized, but I coldly waved her away, saying sharply, Go to hell, Tracy! After which she was taken away. Soon after, I either lost consciousness or was given painkillers and lay in a deep doze for three days. When I woke up, I was greeted by a nurse named Rose. Sitting alone in the ward, I examined my injuries, a cast on my right forearm, bandages on my left eye and nose. Despite these wounds, I looked in stable condition, surrounded by medical equipment that monitored my condition. After Dr. York sedated me for a possible mild concussion and gave me something to help me sleep, I woke up to find my left wrist handcuffed to the bed railing. Detective Sergeant Hartman informed me that I had been arrested on several charges, including trespassing and using a weapon, because my wife and two other people had filed a complaint against me. Rose later confirmed that she was aware of the situation. Dr. York assured me of my recovery and informed me that I would be transferred to a new department. A few days later, a lawyer named Sam Wilson came to me and offered to plead guilty in order to negotiate with the district attorney. I said I was innocent and asked about my children, who were under the care of my wife's sister. The sudden upheaval in my life made me worry about my crumbling marriage, the well-being of my children, and my job. I gave Sam my company's contact information and asked him to inform my boss about the situation. After reviewing the charges against me, I questioned the charge of spousal crime mentioned by Detective Sergeant Hardman. Sam explained that Stanley Cross had reported numerous cases of cruelty towards Tracy, backed up by photographs of her injuries. Despite my protests, Sam suggested that we consider pleading guilty at the time of the arraignment to mitigate the severity of the charges. But I hesitated, fearing the possible consequences of admitting guilt. In preparation for the upcoming litigation, I asked Sam to contact my uncle, Jonathan Allen Carter, a retired naval lawyer known for his knowledge of family law. I stressed the need for confidentiality in order to prevent premature disclosure of my plans. After consulting with his uncle, Jack agreed to provide legal assistance, while emphasizing the importance of keeping the details of the case secret. During the trial, which was broadcast on hospital television, I pleaded not guilty to all charges. Despite the prosecutor's request not to post bail, the judge decided to keep me in the hospital for two more days before the hearings begin, which will decide whether I will go to court. Before I was sent to prison, Jack, who was now my official lawyer, visited me. It was a huge relief to see him, and hugging him made me feel very excited. Until that moment, I didn't realize how much I needed support. After our meeting, Jack got down to business. He wanted to talk to me alone and shared some important details. He spoke briefly with Lucy and assured me that the children would be fine with her until everything settled down. Lucy was confused by Tracy's account of what had happened and was grateful for Jack's support. Jack was interested to know the details of how I ended up in such a predicament. I opened up to him, telling him about the events that had happened. He was shocked by my story. I also shared with him a false story that Stanley Crossman Angel and Tracy fabricated after my arrest. In a low voice, I informed Uncle Jack that I had recorded everything on video using my iPhone, safely hidden at home. Although he remained unperturbed, I felt a glimmer of relief in him realizing that there might be evidence in favor of my version. 
Jack assured me of his continued support in this difficult situation. He advised me to focus on my recovery while he handled my case and explored bail options. I agreed and asked him to look after my children. He assured me that he would keep in touch through Lucy. After being discharged from the hospital, I was escorted to prison. Three days have passed without any messages from Jack. In the end, I appeared before the judge, and Jack was by my side. He argued for my bail, but instead I was placed under house arrest. Jack rented an apartment for me in a gated community where I was supposed to live with him, but I was not allowed to leave the territory. Jack hatched secret plans, revealing them only as they were implemented. He enlisted the help of private detectives to follow up on various leads. An obstacle in the form of an injunction prevented me from getting my phone out of the kitchen drawer, which was a serious problem. Despite this, Jack decided not to break down the door, but to wait for the decision to come by itself. At that time, he set up a new account on his mobile phone so that both of us could stay in touch. I contacted my neighbor, the colonel, to keep him informed of my circumstances. The colonel discussed with Jack what was going on around my house. Jack suggested inviting the colonel to his place for beer, steaks, and barbecue in order to understand this issue more deeply. The colonel told about the incident, which he witnessed shortly after the quarrel. He saw some people near my garage, called the rescue service, and came out to them with an aluminum bat. Despite the threats, they fled in a black SUV, and their faces are captured in the photo. The colonel also mentioned that when he returned to the house, he saw Tracy talking to some men near the garage. After recording the license plate of the SUV, Jack conducted a small investigation. He found out that the license plate is linked to Unique Services, a private detective firm owned by Jose Gonzalez and Miguel Ortego, who have questionable backgrounds in law enforcement. Interestingly, among the clients of Unique Services was the law firm of Stanley Cross. I urgently needed to pick up my mobile phone from the kitchen in the house. Jack came up with a plan to meet with Tracy under the pretext of mediation, which should be attended by her lawyer's assistant. At six o'clock in the evening, Jack arrived at the place, where he was warmly welcomed by Tracy and Gordon Merritt from Cross's law firm. After they met, they gathered in the family room to discuss problems, and both recorded the conversation. Jack expressed regret and subtly questioned my version of events in particular my claim that Tracy and Mr. Cross were having an affair, and my angry reaction to seeing them together. Mr. Merritt entered the conversation, saying that the evidence was not in my favor. Jack then invited Mr. Merritt to testify about my mental state during the incident, emphasizing my belief that Mr. Cross was trying to take Tracy away. He also stressed that I was a good husband and father. On reflection, Mr. Merritt offered to consider such an offer if I plead guilty to the charges against me. Jack asked if some of the charges could be mitigated or dropped, to which Mr. Merritt replied that he needed to discuss it with Mr. Cross. He has influence in the district attorney's office. Perhaps we can find a solution to make this situation disappear. Not only is it good for Mr. Ramsey, but it's also not the best option for Mr. Cross to get involved in a high-profile lawsuit. This undermines his reputation and business. That's the main reason I came here to tell you, Tracy. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me. Blake wanted me to convey his love and longing for my children, Jack said. Tracy seemed touched by this, and tears welled up in her eyes. Before turning off the recording device, Jack warned of the consequences if he could prove my words. If I can prove the falsity of your testimony, you may be charged with perjury and obstruction of justice, which is fraught with imprisonment, Jack said. Just as Gordon Merritt was about to speak, Jack turned his attention to him. As for you, Counselor, if I can prove that you knew about the deception of your client, Mr. Cross, you may also face legal consequences. Take the time to discuss this among yourselves before responding. With that, Uncle Jack took the recorder and left. While you're conferring, can I get some water? He asked. Of course, go, Jack. The kitchen is in that hallway over there. Tracy pointed to the door to the dining room. 
In the kitchen, Jack made sure he wasn't visible and took my iPhone out of the drawer by the sink. Picking up the phone, he poured himself a glass of iced water and returned to the family room. Tracy, do you have anything to add before I leave? He asked. Tracy looked nervously at Gordon Merritt, who spoke on her behalf, saying that at the moment they had nothing more to add and they would inform Mr. Carter of any changes regarding the accusations against me, counting on my help in resolving this issue. Jack agreed, thanked Tracy for the meeting, and informed Mr. Merritt that he would see him in court. Instead of returning the iPhone to the townhouse, Jack commissioned Digital Analysis Solutions, DAS, to examine its contents. He informed the DAS director about the case and stressed the importance of video and audio recordings for my defense. DAS assured Jack that they would conduct a thorough analysis and provide their findings within a few days. Later, Jack and I went to the DAS office to get their report. DAS transferred all the data from my iPhone to its server and made several copies of the videos for safekeeping, saving them on DVDs, flash drives, and in the cloud. Watching the video for the first time, Jack and I were able to see all the conversations leading up to the incident, including Max's attack, which clearly showed that I was acting in self-defense. Although some moments were visually indistinct, the audio recording effectively conveyed what was happening. Fortunately, the audio recording also recorded Max pointing a gun at me. As soon as we decided that the briefing was over, the DAS director mentioned that we still had something to discuss. In addition to the usual contents of my phone photos, contacts, emails, and messages, there were 97 new emails and 64 unread text messages. DAS scanned them without opening them, and most turned out to be genuine messages from friends and relatives. But one message seemed suspicious. It contained 27 children's photos. If I went to it, the photos would be on my phone. When I got rid of the computer, I realized that Cross must have tried to put these photos in my phone. Uncle Jack and I thanked DAS for his help and left my phone with them. We brought copies of the video home. Later, Jack seemed lost in thought. What are you thinking, Jack? I am considering our next steps, he replied. We could present this to the district attorney now and maybe get the charges dropped against you. Cross, Max, and Tracy may be in trouble, but if Cross has the necessary influence, the situation can be resolved. I have considered other options. Jack offered to wait until the hearing. The prosecutor will most likely call all the participants in the conspiracy to testify, and then we will be able to tell our version of events. The district attorney will have grounds to charge them with conspiracy, perjury, and other crimes, which can lead to a significant prison term he said. It occurred to me that I could regain custody of the children. What is your decision? He asked. We can either get this case over with quickly, or we can have a long trial accusing them all of a big conspiracy. Without hesitation, I expressed my willingness to deal with them. I've always wanted to publicly expose them and turn them in court like Perry Mason, Jack admitted. It amused me that even an experienced lawyer like him has strange aspirations. We were looking forward to the hearing scheduled in three weeks, and Jack was diligently preparing his case, warning against revealing our trump card, the video, too early to prevent it from being suppressed by the prosecution. A week before the hearing, Jack had to return home to San Francisco on other business. During his absence, the security guard at the entrance called me and informed me that Tracy Ramsey, who claims to be my wife, had arrived. After consulting with Jack, who advised me to remain calm and respectful, I allowed Tracy to enter, despite the fact that she confessed her toxic attitude towards me. Come on in, Tracy, I greeted. You look great. Thank you, Blake, she replied. You look very fit and handsome, she added. I told him that I regularly work out in the gym and monitor my diet, mainly sticking to fruits and vegetables, avoiding harmful foods. Tracy confessed her love to me and expressed regret for the way things had turned out. I never thought it would turn out like this, she said. I replied, you wanted me to adopt the cross lifestyle, didn't you? 
You thought you were going to have fun with him, and we could make good money. Tracy admitted that these plans belonged more to Cross, and that none of them expected my aggressive reaction. It wasn't like you, considering how calm and easygoing you usually are, she remarked. Maybe that's why he thought I was easy to manipulate, I suggested. Tracy admitted that she was horrified to see how violent I had become. This is the side of me that I've been trying to bury since I served as a Marine in the Middle East. I assured her that I wasn't like that anymore. When she asked about my car, I explained that I had moved her to a safe place after Cross threatened to plant pills in her. Tracy then told me that the men in the house were planning to plant evidence in my car, but she didn't want to go through with it. I begged her to tell the truth to the district attorney to clear my name, but she said she couldn't do it because of Stanley's influence. Feeling helpless, I noticed that I was unlucky and asked her about the insult charge. Judging by the photos, you have cuts and bruises. I didn't raise my hand against you. Did Stanley do it? I asked. As soon as you left, he immediately came up with another story. According to him, you accused us of having an affair and then attacked me. When he intervened, a scuffle ensued. He claims that you broke his nose, gave him a black eye, and shot Max before he could help. To make his story more convincing, he also hit me several times. Tracy confessed with tears in her eyes. I'm so sorry, Blake, she sobbed. I never wanted any of this to happen. I just want us to get back to what was between us she continued. It's impossible, I said firmly. There's a way out, Blake, Tracy insisted earnestly. Stanley knows about your heroic past and that you are struggling with post-traumatic stress disorder. He wants you to plead guilty on these grounds. He thinks he can use his connections to send you to a veteran's hospital for treatment. After that, we could start all over again, just the two of us and the kids. It became clear that her intention was to convince me to accept a guilty plea and commute the sentence. I pretended to be considering her offer. It sounds promising, Tracy, but I need time to think about it, and I need to discuss this with Jack. He wasn't very successful in finding evidence in favor of my case. Do it for yourself, Blake, she urged. For the sake of us and the children, we will be able to put all this in the past in a few years. I doubt it very much, I replied. You cheated on me, wanted me to accept your betrayal, threatened to take my children away, and now you're setting me up. It's not just a small obstacle. Tracy tearfully begged, but I interrupted her, ending the conversation. I suggested that she leave, but she insisted on staying, offering to forget about our problems for a while. That's not going to happen, Tracy, I said firmly. Tracy understood my position. She asked me to think about Stanley's offer before I walked her to the door. When she hugged me goodbye, it was sincere, but I didn't reciprocate. The hearing was supposed to determine if I would stand trial, and the prosecution looked confident. During the hearing, Cross, Max, and Tracy acted as witnesses, each of them sticking to their rehearsed stories. Jack questioned them briefly, asking if their statements were true, and they all confirmed them. He also wanted to interrogate Jose and Miguel, but their involvement in framing me was considered irrelevant to my accusations, and the attempts were unsuccessful. When the prosecution was over, Jack asked to provide the video as proof of my innocence with the permission of the court. The assistant district attorney objected, citing the fact that the evidence was new. Jack gave an explanation, stating that there are concerns that his client may be biased. The judge asked for evidence of bias, to which Jack pointed to the video. The judge offered to watch the video in the office, but Jack refused, expressing distrust of the impartiality of the court. The judge continued to insist, asking if there were allegations of corruption against the court. The judge asked if Jack could provide evidence to support his claim, or if it was contained only in the video. Jack confirmed that the evidence was indeed contained in the video, but asked for an opportunity to explain his point of view in more detail through questions. Jack explained that, in his opinion, by asking a few questions, he would be able to demonstrate the court's biased attitude towards his client. The judge allowed Jack to continue asking questions on the condition that, if he could not prove his point of view, 
the video would be reviewed privately for admissibility. Jack warned that if the video was not allowed in court and I was found guilty based on the testimony of prosecution witnesses, he would share it with the media. He also hinted that the video might raise doubts about the integrity of the judge, who did not present it in court. The judge felt threatened by Jack's words, but Jack quickly turned the conversation in another direction, mentioning that the judge's eldest son was studying at college. Is he enrolled in the Air Force Academy? asked Jack. Yes, the judge confirmed. He's a freshman. Getting into the Air Force Academy is quite difficult, isn't it? Jack continued. The judge agreed. Initially, your son had to apply through a congressman or senator and then take the civil service exam. After his candidacy was approved by nine other candidates, he passed medical tests, aptitude tests, and an aptitude exam. Besides, he had to pass the exams. Is that all accurate, Your Honor? Yes, the judge replied. He did well in high school and was a member of the swimming team. You should be proud of him, Your Honor, Jack admitted. Get to the point, Mr. Carter, the judge demanded. Did your son's package of documents include three letters of recommendation? Yes, Mr. Carter. And who was the author of these letters, Your Honor? The judge paused before answering. The authors of the two letters were his swimming coach and his math teacher, the judge explained. And who wrote the third letter, Your Honor? Mr. Stanley Cross wrote a brilliant recommendation for the Air Force Academy, the judge said. Mr. Cross must have known your son well unless he made up the details, Jack remarked. My son had an internship at Mr. Cross's office during the school holidays. He dreams of becoming a lawyer, the judge said. So... Mr. Cross is more of a professional acquaintance than a family friend, Jack asked. He is my friend and colleague in some of the legal groups that I belong to, the judge clarified. Now you understand why the defense doubts your impartiality, Jack concluded. You have questioned my honesty, the judge replied. Although any connection with Mr. Cross would not have influenced my decisions, you have made it a matter of perception. The lights went out. The screens went down and Jack whispered to me, Well, Blake, before turning on the video in court. When the video showed Cross's ties to law enforcement, the atmosphere in the courtroom tensed and the assistant district attorney left the courtroom in tears. In another video, Cross, Max, and Tracy try to leave, but are stopped by the judge. The third video caught everyone by surprise. It captures Tracy's involuntary confession recorded on a hidden iPhone. In this regard, the meeting was adjourned so that the assistant prosecutor could familiarize himself with the new evidence. When the court reconvened, three prosecution witnesses were absent. The district attorney was present instead. Without hesitation, he appealed to the court, stating that all charges against me were dropped because, in their opinion, I acted in self-defense against Mr. Cross and Mr. Angel, and my aggressive actions were justified. In addition, arrest warrants were issued for Mr. Stanley Cross, Mr. Max Angel, and Mrs. Tracy Ramsey for various offenses such as conspiracy, perjury, perjury, and obstruction of justice. An attempt by Mr. Cross to plant false evidence against me was exposed, and the involvement of Mr. Angel and Tracy was also noted. Efforts have been made to detain two more people involved in these schemes. Although Stanley Cross, Max Angel, and Tracy were initially taken into custody, they were later released. The district attorney was furious to learn that his office had been influenced by Stanley Cross for many years. He launched an investigation to root out all colleagues associated with Cross. All the defendants were found guilty, and Max and Tracy confessed against Stanley. He received 11 years in prison, Max, 7, and Tracy, 3, and the term was reduced from 5 after her warning about the attack of Cross sounded in my testimony. Jose and Miguel were charged with obstruction of justice and tampering with evidence, as a result of which they were arrested for possession of videos involving minors. Cross was being held in the county jail awaiting transfer to a state prison, and Max and Tracy were given two weeks to settle their cases before surrendering. Max was preparing the family for his absence, hoping for parole in four years, and Tracy, 
having received a shorter sentence, agreed to serve her sentence in a rural prison that Jack organized. I allowed Tracy to stay with the children to give her the opportunity to get closer to them and explain her upcoming absence. The day before she was put in jail, Tracy asked me to move in with her. When I arrived, she greeted me warmly, saying, This is your home. She was dressed casually but decently, and there was a small bag by the door, which, as she joked, had everything she needed. Tracy made a light breakfast in the kitchen, and we discussed that Lucy would come to take her to the sheriff's office at 11 in the morning. She assured me that Lucy would help with the children and urged me to accept her help. Tracy wanted me to get settled in before the kids returned from school so as not to disrupt their daily routine. She expressed uncertainty about dating in prison, but promised to write often and ask the children to do the same. Her belongings were packed in plastic containers and stored in the basement, and a family photo was left in each child's room so that they would not forget it. Tracy mentioned that she recently bought a new double bed with fresh sheets and blankets for the master bedroom, which was left unused. As she spoke, tears welled up in her eyes, and it became obvious that we still had to discuss our personal relationship. When she started tidying up the table, I suggested we go to the family room and have coffee. Glancing at her watch, she realized that time was running out and expressed sincere remorse. Tracy admitted she was wrong and apologized for her actions, recognizing me as an exceptional husband, father, and breadwinner. She admitted that she had forgotten about the strong partnership that once existed between us, and expressed regret that she had allowed Stanley Cross to influence her behavior. At that moment, the reflection of the woman I married appeared in front of me again. I am fully responsible for the consequences of my actions. Despite the influence of Stanley Cross, I eventually made decisions that led me down the wrong path. I feel great shame. It's hard for me to look you in the eye. Part of me wants to escape to a place where I won't have to run into you. I understand that you will never forget, but I hope that over time the pain will subside and you will find the strength in your heart to forgive me. That's what I'm holding on to at the moment. Tracy finished her speech, wiped away her tears, and then stood up to offer me more coffee. I hugged her tightly as she stood in front of me with tears streaming down her face. We hugged each other. When Tracy heard Lucy's car horn honking, she knew it was time to leave. Wiping away her tears, she packed her things and confessed her love to me, after which she left. I stayed, sorting out my things. Later, Lucy called to offer her support, and I gratefully agreed, knowing that we needed to talk about parenting together. Without Tracy, I took on the responsibility of being a single dad, taking care of Tyler, Beth, and Emily. Lucy was very supportive when she took on the role of mom. After waiting for about a month, she and the children went to visit Tracy. Lucy returned delighted with the visit and talked about the wonderful visiting area in the prison. Three months later, I finally visited Tracy myself. She looked cheerful, especially when talking to the children, but deep down she still felt a heavy sense of regret. During one of these visits, I was introduced to Tracy's friend Candy, who was nicknamed the doll for her past mistakes. Candy also expressed regret for her actions. A year has passed, and Tracy is on the verge of considering parole. Jack suggested that she take online paralegal courses at the University of Virginia, believing that legal experience was a promising career path. Tracy agreed and signed up for the course. Meanwhile, Lucy and I were looking for a suitable place for Tracy to live after her release. We found a cozy, two-bedroom townhouse with a garage, conveniently located near the courthouse and law offices in the city. We bought it with the expectation that Tracy would eventually pay us back. On the day of Tracy's release, Lucy picked her up alone due to the need for paperwork. When they arrived at their new home, Tracy was overjoyed and shed tears, both our families were there to greet her, as well as Jack and his wife. The children gave Tracy a tour of the house and cooked dinner for her on the terrace. After settling into the house, Tracy expressed her gratitude to everyone for accepting her, despite her past. 
Jack had arranged interviews for her at various law firms, and she was grateful for his constant support. After Tracy found her place at the law firm that Jack recommended, she invited me to have dinner with her. She cooked my favorite dish, meatloaf with potatoes and peas. Throughout dinner, we avoided discussing the past and instead immersed ourselves in conversations about children, work, and the weather. After dinner, we retired to the family room, where Tracy turned on soft music playing against the background of the TV's music channel. I asked you to come over tonight, Blake, she began, because I want to discuss our future, or rather, the future of our relationship. What do you think about where we're going? I'm not sure what the future holds for me, Tracy. I don't have a crystal ball to predict it, I replied. But here's what seems most likely to me. We will continue to raise our children together as a team. They rely on both of us equally. Your return home has greatly facilitated my duties, and I have some free time. I'm sure you will also appreciate the opportunity to be alone without the constant presence of children. Unlike you, I lead a fairly active social life. It's nice to go out for dinner or a movie sometimes. When you get used to it, I think you'll like to lead a more active social life too. Blake, have you ever dreamed of a permanent reconciliation with me? Tracy asked. If you mean remarriage, the answer is no. Too much has happened for me to marry you again, but I have left the past in the past and expect to maintain friendly relations without any romantic attachments. It's as close as we'll ever be, I replied. Tracy looked down, tears in her eyes. I didn't think this would happen, but I had to ask. I think in the future I will become more sociable and maybe start a serious relationship, I reflected. Someday I will meet someone special who I can love and ask to marry me. It doesn't matter if she is single, divorced, or widowed, with or without children. I'll find someone. The same goes for you, I assured Tracy. When you get used to your new life, you will most likely also find a loved one who may ask you to marry him. But that doesn't mean we won't keep in touch. We will always have our children to bring us closer. We will celebrate birthdays, holidays, and maybe even vacations together. There will be graduations and weddings in the future. This is the best we can hope for in terms of being together, I said. Tracy remarked sadly, Maybe it's more than I deserve, but I can accept such a future. Before I left, Tracy expressed gratitude for the way I treated her after returning home. She admitted that I could have easily shut her out and kept the kids away, but I didn't. You are not who you are, she said. It just makes me feel even more sorry for what I did to you. As I opened the door to leave, I assured her, You may not have noticed, Tracy, but I've forgiven you. I don't hold a grudge against you, and I hope that in time you will be able to forgive yourself. Tracy replied, Maybe someday, but not anytime soon. We hugged and stood there for a few minutes without talking. Then I let her go, went out into the fresh air, got into the car, and drove home in silence.